Hey guys. Hey, what's up, guys? Good morning. Hey, Andy. Yeah, so today, you know, I think we're going to be discussing a pretty interesting topic that everyone, you know, is very, I guess, concerned with or interested in, is which is the, uh, the core. So we're going to focus a lot on that. I think Andy's going to, you know, give a more better introduction than myself. But again, we just want to reiterate that, you know, we believe truth is the cornerstone to your success. And with that, I'd say, Andy, take it away. Yeah, yeah. All right. So yeah, welcome, guys. Uh, another episode of the A is A podcast. Yeah. And like Ricky said, it's uh, core strength and uh, all about the core. That's going to be our topic for today. Um which I'm actually, I'm really interested in hearing what you guys have to say about this because I don't know if I've ever really taken the time to, um, I don't know, solidify my thoughts about core strength and just the core in general. Um, you know, it's something that makes its way into our training a lot where we have to work with clients and we see weaknesses in the core and um, uh, issues with the core a lot. And we work on that with clients. But um, so I would deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis like you guys do. Um, but I've never really taken the time to kind of think through some of these things. Um, so I'm kind of curious what you guys are going to have to say about this. Um, but I did think it would be important to discuss just because there's definitely a lot of interest in core strength. I mean, Josh, you've assessed a million clients, you know, over the last 10 years. And one of the most common goals when we're initially asking clients what their goals are, I hear all the time, core strength. I want to work on my core. I want to work with, like, that's a really, really common thing. And... I've always found as a trainer that um, it, that's kind of an interesting answer that clients give because sometimes I wonder what they're really asking for. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. like, like, oh, you think your core is weak. How did you determine that? Why, why do you think that your core is weak? And a lot of times what I've found, you know, now in my years of training is that clients who say that they want to work on their core or they need, they need to do core work, they, they typically the, they're weight loss clients. They're people that just want six pack abs. They want to see a lean midsection. They want to, you know, if it's a guy, they might want, want a six pack or if it's a, a female client, maybe they want a flatter stomach or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but visible abs and like a lean midsection is very different from a strong core. <laughs> so there's just kind of a lot of confusion there, you know, and I thought that we could have sort of an interesting discussion around that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and both are fine goals. Like, you know, I mean, ideally, I like the idea of having visible abs and a strong core. You know, it's not like it has to be one or the other. Like, having both is great. Um, but there is kind of a difference there that I thought would be kind of fun to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, Josh, is that something that you've seen, like, is, is uh, wanting to work on the core or core strength, like, one of the most common things that you see with clients, too? Yeah, it, definitely. And I think that the majority, like you said, I think they're really sort of saying they want different aesthetics. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if they really care about improving the strength in the core, like, like metric wise, like side bridge, 30 seconds to side, and now they can do 90 seconds to side. Like, I don't know if that's really what they're going after. Um, as opposed to, I think if they are a strong core, they correlate to maybe rip or mm -hmm. six pack abs. And, um, you know, we, and we're gonna definitely dive into this in probably some detail, but that's not the case. <laughs> right. Um, I will occasionally have people that want better posture mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and they understand that they slump a lot, um, you know, and so they know that their core is weak or they used to be able to do a certain movement um, and now they can't in their mm -hmm. core. Um, low back pain. So sometimes the chiropractor will say you need a stronger core. So that's, we're getting some of those kinds of people that come in. Um, but yeah, I would say 80%, I would say uh, when they say they want core, core they want to work on their core, they mm -hmm. want a leaner and tighter midsection. <laughs> right. So what we'll talk about today is we'll probably talk about strengthening the core mostly, like why that's important and, and whatnot. But maybe if we just touch on really quick the whole, if you want a visible um, midsection, like visible abs or just a leaner, flatter stomach or whatever, um, that's going to be more a function of your diet than anything, you know, and, and just your overall health, you know, making sure that you're not carrying added body fat that's preventing you from seeing your 
your abdominal muscles, right? That's kind of covering them up. So that's really more a matter of like making sure you have a good healthy diet and that you're actually at a low body fat percentage so you can see your abs or have a flat midsection. Um, and I'd like to say too that uh, having a visible um, six pack, for example, doesn't mean you have a strong core. Yeah. You can have an you can have an incredibly strong core. I think some of the people who have the the strongest cores on the planet. You can't see their abs at all. Like I'm thinking of like mm -hmm. powerlifters and strongmen yeah. and stuff. Like yeah. the amount of bracing that they have to do with their midsection is insane. They have ridiculous mm -hmm. core strength, mm -hmm. but a lot of times they have kind of big bellies and you know you when you when you look at them you don't think of them as having like an impressive core yep. even though it's insanely strong but on the same token flip side we see a lot of people who have visible abs like if you if they take the shirt off they have a six pack but incredibly weak yep. core yep. Mm -hmm. it, just because you can see it doesn't mean that it's strong being able to see it just means there's not fat covering it <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think that's, there's another side to, I do think that dieting is probably the most important way you're ever going to see your abs mm -hmm. as, you know, a point of what the easy fit challenge and how I can see my abs now versus before I couldn't, yep. but I was also a power lifter before. Mm -hmm. So there's that correlation, but you have to do some sort of training on your abs in order to really have visible abs. Once you lose all that weight. To give them some shape, yeah. Right. If the, so, if your if your goal is a six pack, like you're gonna have to do some sort of ab work mm -hmm. in order to actually visibly see them, even if you cut down to lower levels of body fat. Right. Yeah. If if you had like super low levels of body fat, but absolutely no muscle in the midsection, you'd probably have a very flat stomach, and you might even be able to kind of see like the the definition and what abs are there. But mm -hmm. if you actually want them to kind of pop out, like, you know, we think of six pack abs as being like little bumps going down, like the, the torso of your body. If you want those little bumps, those little muscle bellies, then you actually have to do a little bit of uh, resistance training to make them grow a bit. That's what Ricky's saying, right? Correct. Yeah. And I would say nine out of 10 people or, or maybe even higher would be, they got to get, if the goal is aesthetics, the, the, it's through nutrition. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, definitely we need some density in the core, which is interesting when we talk about true core strength, a lot of times you get, um, in some individuals, almost like a, um, a thick core, <laughs> the, yep. like we talk like with the power lifters or there's a lot of people I know that are thin individuals, but very strong and their core is thicker than the chest almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it just that's how that's how strong they are in that area. It's not uncommon. Like for example, like George Saint Pierre. Like, yes. Look exactly. at his core before a fight. It almost looks like he's bloated. He's not bloated. He's just he has muscle on muscle on muscle between the back and the ass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Intruding out like a tree. I think of it like a tree trunk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have some guys in jujitsu. It's the same way. Yeah, they're lean, but they've got like to bear hug down the stick and they're skinny guys, but their core is just thick. Mm -hmm. They've got a lot of muscle there. <laughs> yeah, and, and so you're, you're touching on a great point there, Josh, which is that that's another misconception really is that the core is just your abs, like your, mm -hmm. your rectus abdominis, the, the little bumps, the ab muscles that go right down the middle. Mm -hmm. When really, if we're talking about the core, um, we're probably talking about the entire trunk, which mm -hmm. means, sure, it's those abs that go down the middle, but it's also going to be some muscles that lie underneath the transverse abdominis. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the obliques, internal and external obliques that tie in it from diagonal angles from the side. It's gonna be your back muscles, like your erector muscles, your multifidus, that kind of thing down the center of the spine. Mm -hmm. um, and you could even, I mean, some people will go as far as to say it's everything that's your entire trunk, like even your, um, your lats, um, you know, your rhomboids, like some people will include all of that in your core as well. Like basically just everything in your trunk. So if you're developing all those muscles, they wrap all the way around your body, you get that thick mm -hmm. appearance, um, or at least just like, a, a, there's a lot of muscles there that can be developed. So you were giving mm -hmm. that George St. Pierre example, he's developed all the way around his core, front to back, side to side. Yep. Um, yeah. That's when I, when I think about that, that 360 degrees that you were just describing, the 3D, mm -hmm. um, I think of it in like three movement patterns that I sort of chunk things down into is compression strength, right? 
but it's like closing the angle between the torso and the legs. So think of it like a sit up or toes to bar. I think mm-hmm. of rotational strength, which is maybe like the beginning portion of a Turkish get up to get to the mm-hmm. elbow or like a windshield wiper hanging off the bar. Um, and then I think of extension strength. So yep. like deadlift, back extension, you know, that to me personally, that covers the, the grounds of, you know. Yeah, I would even add back. one more in there, which would be, um, so you've got flexion of the spine, extension of the spine. You've got mm-hmm. the rotation and anti-rotation sort of thing. And then I would even add in like a side bending, like you can oh, bend yeah. laterally. So we're talking like the QL mm-hmm. muscles and the obliques are involved in that. Yep. And what, what do you guys think about the, the vacuum exercise? You know, I've never, it's kind of funny. I, I sort of learned how to do those a while back um, accidentally. Um, and we're talking like in my early twenties because mm-hmm. I was trying to suck in my gut to look impressive. <laughs> you know, like if you're on the beach and you're like trying to like kind of flex your abs a little bit when you're a kid, you know, and like look mm-hmm. a little bit cooler or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I can really like kind of draw in my stomach and it looks kind of cool here. I, it wasn't until later that I learned that I was activating the, uh, the TA, the transverse abdominis muscle to kind of like, it's like a corset that goes around your, your midsection. I was like just tightening up in that area. Mm-hmm. And that's an incredibly important muscle for a lot of lifts, like, you know, deadlifts and squats and stuff. Um, I stumbled upon it <laughs> kind of through vanity, but yeah, that's, mm-hmm. it's not something I train. Ricky, do you train the TA, uh, um, specifically at all? Um, I do on occasion. I don't do it very often, okay. but I would say I probably hit it at least once a week. Oh, nice. Okay. What do you, what specific exercise, is there anything that you do for that or? I, I mean, I do the vacuum exercise. Okay. So you do do some. Yeah. Of that. And you, and you hold it for an X amount of time for however many sets. So you can start at like 30 seconds and then work your way all the way up to like 60 second sets. Interesting. Do you find it really pretty challenging? Do you notice that that muscle is working and it gets hard towards the end of the set? It does. And you can do it in different um, positions. So like laying down is a lot easier. You know, if you do it standing up, it's a little bit more challenging. If you're doing it like in a plank position or if you're doing in other types of positions, it actually gets more and more challenging. But, and and they all have their effects and benefits depending on where you are in your progressions and how well you, you know, how far you go. But I mean, for the Most people, I think just doing, you know, either 30 seconds, five sets or working your way to 60 seconds, five sets standing is more than enough. Okay. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. I haven't isolated. You know who does that, um, is quite famous for is, um, Hicks and Gracie. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that jujitsu, one of the, not going to say founder, but one of the gods within jujitsu. Um, he did a lot of, is that also called like diaphragmatic breathing, like diaphragm breathing? Is that the same thing? Or am I getting that confused where you're, you're pulling your, um, belly button into your spine? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. He's done a lot of that. A lot of that. Um, and maybe I don't even know what he's training with that. I don't do it myself, but it sounds like it's the same thing. Yeah, I'd be curious to talk to someone who's really interested, you know, really into training that muscle to know what kind of uh, results they get from their training, like where they notice that it helps them, you know, Mm -hmm. um, or if they're just activating it for the the sake of activating it, um, but they don't notice much carryover to, you know, their their daily activities. I don't know. I never never trained that targeted. I know that Hickson was training it not for core strength. Um, he was training it for awareness around breathing, breath holding. Hmm. Um, so I think there was a, a big inhale uh, where he would pull as tight in as he can. And mm-hmm. then he would do these short exhales followed by more inhales. And there's a pattern, and I'm sure there's mm-hmm. people that know way more about that. But he was doing it for breathing, like efficiency yeah. around breathing. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I don't think it has any like, I'm not going to say this for a fact, but I don't think it has like huge benefits. Like you can have a really strong core without training it, mm-hmm. but it's, it's almost like for better, I would, I want to say almost like better posture in some ways, like where if you have rounded shoulders and your shoulders are always forward, we always say, Hey, pull your shoulders back, start working, you know, your, uh, your scapula or whatever. And you start doing all this other stuff. 
is the same way where if you want to have, you know, that kind of tight core and be kind of more upright and have more stability, it kind of does that. It's like, instead of having your gut always hang out or your stomach always hang out, working that muscle kind of keeps it in and tight. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things I was going to say next was, uh, we should touch on quick, we're, we're talking about the function of the core here. So we mentioned like some of the movements that you can do, like flexing the spine, extending, rotating, and so on. Um, but I think like when people think of what the core muscles do, that's usually what they think of is which way they make you move. When I think it's kind of important to understand that probably the most important um, function of the core muscles is to stabilize the spine and to prevent movement. Yep. So like when you're under a load, let's say you're doing a, a deadlift that wants to round your back over, it's those core muscles and back that keep your spine in an extended neutral position and keep you safe. You know, in a squat, it's that those core muscles that keep you from being loose and leaning forward too much or overarching or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, in a push up, it's, you know, those core muscles that prevent you from arching on the way back up and keep you in a nice straight body line. So, uh, you know, the most important aspect of the core to me, I think, is stabilizing the spine and allowing you to keep a nice neutral or whatever spinal position you want yep. through whatever movement you're doing. Yep. Um, I totally, totally agree with that stability. Yeah, and that's why it's so, that's probably my number one reason for saying that the core is really important to strengthen mm -hmm. is just to prevent injury um, in activities that you do throughout life, you know, like um, picking up a bag of groceries or doing yard work or whatever, like being able to brace your, your, your midsection and keep your spine safe, keep your spine in a nice safe position mm -hmm. is a way to prevent herniated discs and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, and it truly is a protection mechanism, maybe the number one. You know, we've seen a lot of people through the years with back issues, or they, they call it back issues, and mm. their core is essentially useless. It's not doing anything, you know. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we're able to stabilize, build strength there, you know, through all those different patterns, in many cases, the back pain goes away. <laughs> right. Because you know, they've got that protection, protection mechanism around it. Um, so if anyone's listening that has back pain, I would explore, you know, as we dive in more with this episode with exercises and stuff like, you know, what you could be doing to test your core strength and train it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now Josh, Ricky, like, um, when you notice, well, I guess, first of all, Josh, like, uh, when you see that, um, when we are assessing clients or working with your clients or whatever, um, and uh, how many of them would you say have a weak core? Is that like a really common thing? And my real question is, how, how do you notice that? Like, like, what are the things that expose a weak core to you? Because I know what I've started to notice more than anything, um, but I'm kind of curious what, what you see in clients um, at the gym or just people working out um, that tells you that they have a weak core and that they should maybe work on it. Like, what, what do you see? Well, the, and how, how common is it? Do, do most people have a pretty sufficient core or are most people deficient or it's about 50-50? Um, yeah, I would say uh, the majority, the vast majority have a very underdeveloped core. Um, not meaning that they can't maybe do anchored sit-ups, which trains the hip flexor, right? right. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, how we, I find this real quick is the number one way is they break out of that hollow position in push-ups, squats, um, deadlifts, they, they just go from that rounded to the arch, rounded to the arch, and there's no ability to just keep the neutral spine. So at the bottom of the push-up, when they drive out of it, they leave their ass on the floor and the chest rises. Right. That may or may not mean decreased chest strength, right, or uh, whatever, but in many cases, it's a core issue also. Right. And we see it in the deadlift, um, rounding or overarching air squats, um, just the inability to brace, like you said earlier, keep sta stable. Yep. Um, that's my number one. The other thing that I put a lot of people through are two quick tests. Um, they're, they're not perfect tests, but I think it tells a lot very fast is a hanging L set mm. and a mm. hanging toes to bar. And so I think that's, very important. Like, can they do an L set? Most many can't. Um, can they do a hanging knee raise? So that would be like 
the stage before the owl set? Can they lift their kneecap above their hip crease mm -hmm. and hold for a period of time if they can? Can they hold their feet out with legs straight, the feet being higher than the hips for a period of time? And then the third would be, can they bring their toes to the bar? Um, that's a quick test I rip them through. And then the other one is the side bridge test. On your elbow with a perfect plank um, in position, can they hold that, you know, 60 to 90 seconds? And I see huge imbalances there. Mm -hmm. So where you may have someone get 18 seconds on the left side and 90 seconds on the right side. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I love it. That's uh, you. You actually have exactly the same answers me. So, because oh. <laughs> I think most people, when they're kind of trying to assess if they have a strong core or not, what they think to do is, like, can I do ten sit ups? Can I do twenty sit ups? You know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and they try these movements, and maybe it's not sit ups or crunches, but maybe they're going to a gym where there's like an ab crunch machine mm -hmm. or something like. But they're trying to perform these like crunching type movements or whatever, and like, can I do that or not? Um, and one thing you touched on is, first of all, most people don't do those correctly. They just use their hip flexors instead. Mm -hmm. um, but what you said, what I liked was where you notice the breakdown in the core is more when they're doing other movements. Like you gave the example of the push up, and they they break. They don't they don't keep that straight body line. And you say, oh, we've you know we we lost the the correct core position there, the correct spinal position. Mm -hmm. Or I see it on things like walking lunges and um, uh, you know, uh, split, split squats yep. and squats. Yep. And, you know, you notice all these sorts of movements where people are just very loose in their core and they're kind of like flopping all over the yep. place. And it's like, you see, you notice that that's where they lose control in these movements that aren't even supposed to be core movements. Like, you yep. know, you think of walking lunge as a leg movement yep. or a push up as an arm movement, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you see, you notice that their core is just all over the place. They're very loose in that midsection. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of my number one thing where, where I notice a lack of core stability or yeah, core strength in clients. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that, does that sound, does that resonate with you, Ricky? Is that kind of where you would assess core strength as well or, or notice the, the de deficiencies? Yeah. I mean, I agree entirely with you too. I think, I mean, you guys have a lot more client experience than myself. So I definitely, I haven't seen it in a lot of clients, but I know specifically for myself that I noticed it more whenever I was doing those heavy lifts. So anytime I had heavy weight on me, I knew that my core couldn't quite stabilize it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I was overdoing it in a, in a sense. And so, but I also think that that's one of the best ways that helped develop my core too, yes. was trying to do those movements correctly mm -hmm. and focusing entirely on form. Mm -hmm. And then, um, on occasion, I'll do, I'll supplement with other ab exercises, but I think doing those core, those main lifts, not technically, I call them my core lifts, but they're not my core lifts. Right, right. You know, technically, no, yeah. I love what you just said. So yeah, you guys are hitting on everything that I wanted to hear because Ricky almost just said that the best core strengthening exercises are actually not the ones that yes. you think of as the core exercises. They're not the sit-ups, yep. um, you know, or the, even the plank necessarily or whatever, but sometimes like, squatting, yep. mm -hmm. walking lunges, yep. deadlifting, those are actually the best core exercises, but mm. you have to actually focus on perfect form. Mm -hmm. So we're talking like, let's say a squat is, if you're going heavy on a squat, that's like a, you're, you're targeting your quads. It's a leg exercise. Mm -hmm. I say go a little bit lighter. Like, don't worry about working out the legs so much and focus on that perfect form. Like you were just saying, Ricky, mm -hmm. paying very close attention to where your, your uh, trunk is and your spine and making sure you stay in the correct position mm -hmm. and challenge your core to maintain absolutely perfect positioning throughout the whole movement. Mm -hmm. um, is one of the best ways to strengthen your core. And you can do that in almost any exercise requires uh, perfect core positioning, you know, mm -hmm. overhead pressing, like all these things. Mm -hmm. so, I was going to say, I actually, within my training, and maybe I'm unique, but like, I don't even differentiate the core. <laughs> me either. Yeah. That's, so, that's why this conversation was going to be so interesting to me because I don't, I really don't think about it because it's no. so it's so uh, integrated into everything else. Every, mm -hmm. Literally everything. And the examples both of you gave were spot on, like squatting, deadlifting, lunges, split squats, like 
power cleans, like everything originates from the core and you can see a fucked up core on any of those movements. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're training the, your stabilizer muscles within the core at a much higher level than some kind of isolated piece um, mm -hmm. with maybe the rare exception of like a very advanced, you know, compression hold, like a Stalder press or right. We can go into detail, but like for the most part, just good solid weightlifting and strength training and uh, upper and lower mm -hmm. develops, even doing pull-ups the right way, yep. like yep. with a chest to bar and staying hollow, not letting your ribs flare to the ceiling. And, you know, you go on and on and on to, to brace that core and keep it tight is used really almost in everything that you do in the weight room correctly. Mm -hmm. and yeah. It, you hit on something actually, because there's one exercise that I didn't even think about was my core at the time, but I started doing like really high rep, uh, lat pull downs mm -hmm. and you know, whenever I was doing heavyweight and just doing like five or whatever it was, didn't really notice it in my core as much. Mm -hmm. But when I was doing sets of 30, mm -hmm. like I was actually sitting there and I was doing sets of 30, you know, chest to bar tight on the lat pull down machine. And my core was on fire mm -hmm. by the end of that. Mm -hmm. yep. So you're yeah. trying to in that perfect position. Yeah. That's the takeaway for clients for this part. If you want a strong core, I think the best way to develop that is by this is an argument for why it's so important to perform exercises with perfect form mm -hmm. um, because perfect form challenges the core um, right. more than anything. You know, your body loves to compensate by leaning in certain ways or, you know, if you're overhead pressing, you might arch your back and do all these things to kind of uh, make the movement easier, rounding mm -hmm. your back on a deadlift, whatever. Um, challenging your core to stay, to keep your, your torso in the proper position during any movement you're doing is probably the best training for your core that it is. It's incredibly challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think to add on that, having a balance between the extension and flexion mm -hmm. is okay. yep. huge with the exercise selection. Cause we're talking a lot here about maybe the abs or compression, mm -hmm. but um, having proper back extension strength correlating to your ab or compression strength i think is really important to that full that full chain because mm -hmm. um, i know there could be some people listening thinking you know the back is such a huge part of core strength mm -hmm. they're right it's like a lot <laughs> so i don't want to ignore that and i'll give an example to the to the people listening myself like right now i'm working on an imbalance within myself and so through the last few years my uh compression strength um so my, think of my abdominals um are actually quite a bit stronger than my extensors mm -hmm. it used to not be like that um it's now it's through jujitsu <laughs> so my ability to do toes to bar or planks or sit-ups or anything engaging the abs is phenomenal probably the strongest i've ever been um but i am getting back pain and some different kinds of things from that due to being pulled forward tight and very very strong in that compressed state so now i'm working on loosening up and becoming more mobile in extension right mm -hmm. and then also strengthening my extensors so deadlift holds and, you know, um, back extensions, um, Sorensen holds, like different. And I, it's sort of sad on my part, but like it's weak, it's weak, it's weak what relevant to what it used to be huh. slash um, compared to my core. And now most people probably have the opposite problem that's common to be weak in the compression and stronger in the extension, but I've built that and it's very common in that sport. Very common. Where, where do you notice that your, uh, your extensors are weak? Like what movements are you noticing the, where you're like saying, I'm not as strong as I used to be. In this One position? of the big things that opened my eyes was um, heavy kettlebell front squats. So okay. like 52s in each arm, but held correctly, like with the handles touching yep. um, to keep that chest up at the very bottom was getting harder for me. Okay. Um, and then I did a few workouts where I was doing three sets of 15 with full rep back extensions with the curl at the bottom and an extension at the top. And I was doing a one second pause lock at the top 
to make sure I could hold that and back down. And the next day I was like, oh my God, my back, like not pain, but just sore. Yeah. Um, and same thing with deadlifts. Like I'm not going super heavy on deadlifts because I don't need to right now, but um, I, I'm just, it's, I can feel it. I'm very aware. Yeah. But those are, those were, it was eye opening for me, you know, and a few months ago I was getting some low mid back pain, if that's even an area, not the low back, but not true mid back, like low mid. Yes. <laughs> um, and it was, I, my abs were literally like, um, almost in a mini spasm in my low back, I was being pulled into flexion. Hmm. As soon as I was able to isolate and open up the abdominal wall and then get the extensors to fire, the back pain went away. Hmm. So I don't know where I went off with that, but just maybe a balanced training approach that we're not just going after the, the, the yeah. Back. Yep. Well, like we said in the beginning, the core is 360 degrees. It's all around your, your trunk mm -hmm. and you want to strengthen all of it. You noticed that your, the front was getting really strong, mm -hmm. but you were starting to neglect the backside. And now you're starting mm -hmm. to bring that back up to stay balanced. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Um, one of the things, uh, that I think also leads to confusion when it comes to like core type, this whole topic mm -hmm. is, um, whether someone has a lack of core strength, which is what we've been talking about so, so far, or just a lack of core awareness. Mm -hmm. Because I, I found that to be maybe even a bigger issue than the strength. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I know that a client has the core strength that's required to do a certain thing, mm -hmm. but they can't figure out like how to, like they're not aware enough of like their core muscles or like the position of their spine mm -hmm. to control like where it is in space. Yep. Mm -hmm. So like they might not know that they're overarching or that they're rounding or mm -hmm. um, that they're losing their posterior pelvic tilt during a certain movement or something like that. Mm -hmm. I found that people have a really hard time uh, even engaging or being aware of where their core is. So you know, having we that, we see that a lot like with handstands, for example, um, someone who can do a posterior pelvic tilt in a plank Mm -hmm. Then they get, they get upside down and they have no idea like where their pelvis is and how to control mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if you want to touch on that at all, just the, whether you think that lack of core awareness is a big issue with people. And then how do we start correcting that? Like, what are some favorite exercises for helping people learn different core positions and how to like mm -hmm. get into that and control it? So um, any thoughts on that? Well, what I think you're talking about is kind of like the mind muscle connection. Yep, exactly. Yep. And just having that, oh, like you're saying, an awareness that you need to engage your core and how to do it in different positions or different scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's definitely possible. I mean, I, there, I think I, in a previous podcast, I had noted something about that with like my lats, where I wasn't engaging my lats on, yep. on the pull up. I was compensating with my arm strength. Yep, do more biceps and not getting the lats engaged as much. And I think, you know, in relation to the core, I think a lot of people are relying on their other muscle groups to compensate versus using their core in that scenario. So, but to figure out a way to get them to engage it in some of those scenarios, I would say either lighten the load mm -hmm. or, you know, if it's a body weight type movement, knock it down to the, the next level down. And do it at light, you know, you have to do either lighter weight or an easier movement and just focus on really engaging the core mm -hmm. in those scenarios. Yep. I'll let Josh chime in, but yeah, I think you're, you're right. Like that's what I would do is I, the lighter movement thing is a, a lighter weight thing is a great idea to like perfect form um, and make sure you can get in the correct position. But also uh, I like what you're saying about we can have some targeted uh, body weight exercises that are, um, uh, kind of regressed down to more of a beginner level. So you're just activating that one muscle and trying to figure out how to use it, like being in a plank and doing a posterior pelvic tilt to like mm -hmm. learn that, get that mind muscle connection and then see if we can start applying that to more complex movements where it might get lost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Josh, did you have any thoughts on this? Like mm -hmm. lack of core awareness and how you can help people develop better awareness? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, the, I think a lot of the awareness stems around almost like um, the muscles sleepy and not activating probably, you know. Mm -hmm. I think um, we're, maybe if we're sitting at a desk all day and not exercising and stuff, we're just not using our core. Mm -hmm. um, and so then we lose awareness. But 
I think the awareness, a lot of it comes from the posterior pelvic tilt and the anterior pelvic tilt, mm -hmm. the ability to do that lying down and standing. And so the way that I teach people to engage like neutral spine and a strong hollow is they lay on their back flat. I sit down by them and then I I'll put my hand on the side of their low back yep. and I'll say, don't let my hand touch your low back. And I slide it in under their low back. Okay. And so their low back can't touch my hand. So what do you have to do? You have to arch and mm -hmm. peel that low back up. That gets pretty close to getting us to an anterior pelvic tilt. There. Yep. And then what I do is I say, crush my hand with your low back and only your low back, just crush it. Mm -hmm. And then they turn their tail or their pelvis right down. And I say, get really heavy on that. And then I move my hand and I say, press your spine into the floor as hard as you can. And then I'll go farther and I'll have them lift their legs. And a lot of times you put their arms overhead too. And then hold that position without the low back coming off the ground. Mm -hmm. And most people that, that, in, that I would say eight or nine out of 10, they get it right there that that's where what I call the strong hollow or a strong posterior tilt. Mm -hmm. um, that one drill does wonders. And then you can hold that for sets. It's the, the drill, we call it the back body line. So on YouTube, they can look that up, the back body line drill. They might also call it like a hollow body hold. Hollow um, body hold, yep. On YouTube, you know. Yep, yep. yep. So that's, um, and that's very hard for people. <laughs> yeah. When they... Not so much once we cue the arch and then the, the posterior tail, most people get that. But as soon as we have them extend their legs, the low back wants to peel off the ground. Yeah. And that's a huge indicator that the abs need to be stronger. So what do we do? We just bring the knees in closer to the hips and the chest to make that lever shorter. And then they're able to smash that low back into the ground. Mm -hmm. And if people wanted to look that up on YouTube, that would be like a bent knee hollow body hold would probably yes. be what that would be called. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Those are probably my favorite exercises too for teaching um, uh, posterior pelvic tilt. Mm -hmm. I like to teach it in standing first because that's usually mm -hmm. the easiest for people to control. Mm -hmm. And then they at least have an idea of, okay, my pelvis can do this, you know, and yeah. then we move to lying down like you were just saying and try to do it there. And I've yeah. also found I like doing posterior pelvic tilts just hanging from a pull-up bar. Yep. You're just hanging passively from a pull-up bar and you do like posterior tilt, anterior tilt, posterior tilt, anterior, just to prove that you can control that motion in yet another position. Now you're not loaded on your feet. Now you're hanging from a bar. I've had a lot of trouble teaching people through the years with the standing version before the ground. Really? Oh, the ground for me is a go-to. Oh, see, I find it easier to teach standing. That's so funny. No, you know what I find is doing the standing version in someone that doesn't have the awareness at all, mm -hmm. they just do like that sway back. I know. They, they just lean back and then they like drop their neck <laughs> and everything is moving but the pelvis. Right. <laughs> There's usually 10 awkward minutes of us trying to figure out like how to control that. But yes, I find that if I can get through that 10 minutes, we can usually find those you know, that, that control in there somewhere. <laughs> You're probably better at cueing it standing than I am. And the, the, the hanging version is even worse. Like they're doing pull-ups and they're like twisting and it's just not isolating. But for some reason through the years, I've had really good luck with don't let my hand touch your low back. Okay, yeah. that's your arch. That's your post or anterior tail. Now smash my low hand and they boom, boom, boom. You know? Another thing I like to do is I, I like to move um, in and out of like uh, an engaged versus a not engaged core. So like I'll put people in a plank position. Once they know how to do like posterior tilt and anterior tilt, I'll put them in a plank position. I'll say, okay, I'll do the anterior tilt, have an arch form in your back. Mm -hmm. And they'll do that. And I'll say, okay, you see, feel that arch in your back, feel how that doesn't feel so nice on your back. Like it feels like something's being compressed there. Usually it's pretty uncomfortable if you're in an anterior mm -hmm. tilt in a plank. Mm -hmm. And then I say, now tuck your tail under you, do the posterior tilt. And we kind of like go back and forth between those positions. Mm -hmm. And I, I just like, instead of just trying to hold a position and having them say, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? It's like, well, let's go into the correct position and then out of it and then back into it and then out of it. And like, just learn how to go through that range of motion that your, your pelvis is capable of. Yeah. And that's a drill 
that's a phenomenal drill and one that can be quite fatiguing. So like if you're in a push up hold and you're protracted nice and strong and you lock that posterior tilt and you, and you're engaged, you're not just hanging out, you're engaged in the posterior tilt and you're on tension. That's very fatiguing, (laughs) you know, for, for most people I find. I'm glad you said that because like, so this is something else that I would want listeners to understand. Um, you know, you can contract a muscle harder or, or less hard, you know? Um, and what I found is some people can engage their core. They can like crunch their abs or do a posterior pelvic tilt, but they don't realize that they can do it harder, so to speak. You know what I mean? Um, so I'll, I'll be doing a plank with a client and you see me doing this. I work out with my clients all the time mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I have a client who can get into the correct position. They can do a posterior pelvic tilt and to them, it's easy. They can go for a minute. They can go for two minutes, whatever. Mm-hmm. But me, I'm like smoked after like 30 seconds or 40 seconds or whatever. And I know that I have like a stronger core, but the difference is I'm contracting as hard as I can. Like I'm not just I'm not just pulling my pelvis into a posterior pelvic tilt like moderately and then just kind of holding that nice stable position. Mm -hmm. I'm actually pulling it as hard as I can into the strongest posterior pelvic tilt I can, Mm -hmm. so that my abs are just like squeezing as hard as possible. And if you do that, you're you're done after 30 seconds. And that's when I can tell like I'm with a client and I can see that they're they're in the, the correct position. They're not breaking. They're doing a posterior pelvic tilt. It looks, it's a good plank, but when they're going for 30 seconds, 45, a minute, they're like, yeah, I don't feel anything. It's like, <laughs> you can do this harder. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I, th- I think that's a big thing with core stuff is sometimes mm-hmm. people, they'll, they might engage, but if you're trying to strengthen, we want to overload. We want to, str- we want to engage it hard. Um, and that's something that would kind of, uh, encourage listeners to, to try doing with your core exercises is don't just get into these positions that are like the correct position, so to speak, but really activate them as hard as you can. If you want to make that, that core stronger. I, I think that's a great point almost on any exercise. Right? Yeah, exactly. It applies and, to everything. And I was doing it the other day. So you saw me and Alex doing those. Tea this this is the difference between like mindlessly going through reps versus like having an intention. Yes. Hmm. You saw us doing, me and Alex, those T raises, right? Yeah, yeah, he looked great doing those. Well, the, the interesting thing is when I do a T raise, I'm squeezing my scapula and retraction as hard as humanly possible, yep. no matter the weight. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not just getting it up, um, and I'm not saying this is what Alex was doing, but many people will, to just get it up just high enough and hang out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and so it's interesting. Could I do more? I'm not sure. Probably if I, but I'm squeezing whether it's five pounds, three pounds, twelve pounds, and, and I can burn just, out very. You don't well. need a lot of weight because if you're if you're actually like focusing on that muscle and just squeezing as hard as you can, yeah. you could probably do it body weight a T yeah. raise and just like I said, just tax those muscles to completion in like 15 seconds. Yes. And when you saw me doing them, when Lori was in the gym the other day, I was using like eights or something for 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. I was squeezing as hard as humanly possible, right? With just the eights, you know, Uh or, and then I was supersetting that with those Cuban rotations, the dumbbell Cuban rotations, Andy, that you Mm -hmm. like so much. It was the same thing, 17 and a half, but I was retracting, depressing, and staying as tight and as perfect as I can that whole time, which could I have done 25s and just fling them around? Maybe, but I was worried about tension the whole yeah. time. So, yeah. yeah. Um, that, that's beautiful. Yeah. I'm glad that we touched on that. Um, let me think. I, we're jumping all over the place here. As far as uh, exercises that actually move the spine, I did want to, met, like you had mentioned, uh, hanging knee raises, toe to bar, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is like the one movement that I probably like more than almost anything for like Maybe. actually flexing the, the spine. Um, I love hanging knee raises as a way to see when a client really does have a truly weak core in that pattern. Mm-hmm. Cause you see so often that they can bring their knees up to their hips, yep. but it's all just hip flexors. Their, their spine is staying totally straight. Yep. And I'm always looking for like, can we start getting a little curl in that spine? Can we start to like tuck the, the pelvis under and round the spine a little bit. Yep. So I'm often encouraging people, like we might start with bringing like knees up to hip level, mm-hmm. but I'm usually trying to 
with, with the clients that I think are going to be capable of this in a few weeks or a few months down the road, I'm trying to get them to start thinking of bringing their, their knees to their chest yeah. and then eventually their knees to their, their face, yeah. you know, and then ideally like you can sooner or later get to the point where you can do a skin the cat on a pull-up bar without touching your feet to the bar. You can actually do like a hanging knee raise and pull all the way through, mm-hmm. um, curl into that tight little ball so you can get your, mm-hmm. your knees and feet through mm-hmm. um, underneath the bar. I think that's a really good point, Andy, when people are hearing us say like the hanging knee raise and the L set. If your legs are too low, the spine stays in place right Mm -hmm. like you said it's not really so much core as opposed to the hip flexor i watch from the side to see when the low back rounds yep and Hmm. that is where if it does at all exactly and my indicator generally is above hip crease so Mm -hmm. like the kneecap or the feet are above the hip crease as high Mm -hmm. as you can get right um, but generally once they break that point, you have to turn that tail, <laughs> yeah. you know, turn the corner a little bit. So, yep. This is something worth, worth, uh, kind of going into a little bit with client or with, uh, listeners, because people sometimes don't really understand that when you, when you, uh, bend at the waist, a lot of times that's just hip flexor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people think that if you're bringing your, your, uh, you know, your stomach towards your thighs or whatever, that that's, um, uh, you, you know, your abs are working like in a sit up, for example, mm-hmm. but when people do sit ups with their feet anchored down, like you were saying earlier, or when they do hanging knee raises, a lot of times we see that the spine doesn't curl at all, right. um, which is what the abdominal muscles are responsible for. And yeah. it's just, they're, they're flexing at the hips, right? Yep. So how can we, um, teach people how to start rounding their spine and actually using their abs instead of just using their hip flexors do you have any favorite ways to do that i've got a couple yeah. but yeah the, for me the, the the number one way if like um you know if the out, knees to elbows like the hanging knees to elbows isn't possible right if that's too right. hard uh which it is for most people and that's fine it's tough um, yeah, that's a great be, way to do it but it's too hard initially for a lot of people so yep. yeah yeah um, would be just a, a tuck on the ground. I don't know what they call it. Maybe a tuck up, they call it, yeah. where you're on your There's back. in and outs. Or in and outs. Yeah. So, yeah. So you start in that, I guess, maybe a crunch position where the shoulder blades are off the ground. Mm-hmm. And then your, your face or your chest is as close to the knees as possible. And you hold that compressed position. Um, and then maybe what Ricky was saying is where they extend from there and then they come back to that tuck position. I don't know if I'm describing it right. Does that make yeah. sense to you guys? What's an in and out, Ricky? I don't know if I've done that. In and outs are generally where your shoulders are off the ground. You know, you kind of support yourself with your hands behind your back and then you bring your knees into your chest. Awesome. So it's basically like a proper hanging knee raise, except we're doing it laying on the back. Yep. Um, like pulling yep. the knees all the way up towards the, the chest or even like the face. So mm-hmm. you get that spinal flexion, you're curling into a ball. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then you just kind of go back out and then tuck them back in, go back out, tuck them back in. Correct. Yeah. Awesome. I like that a lot. That's, I do it like a similar thing where I pe- put people in a plank position, um, but their feet are on like a yoga ball and they have to draw their knees into their chest, you know, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. the yoga ball rolls across the floor. And Those again, good. it's a tough one because usually people – hike at the hips they allow their their butt to go way up in the air and they just kind of fold into a v so i i tell people okay you know that was good like that was a good first warm-up set now we're going to work on keep the hips really low keep them right in that position where they're in in the plank but we're going to try to draw the the knees all the way into the chest without letting the hips rise up and usually you can see they start to get that flexion in the spine and they they use their abs a little bit more that's a great i've seen you do that a lot of times i forgot about that I'm going to, I want to try that with some of my clients. I think that people do them on TRX straps too, like putting their feet in the straps or putting their feet in gymnastics rings. And I don't like that version as much because the straps kind of pull you back and pull you out of position. Mm -hmm. Um, The ball rolls nicely across the floor and you can just focus on rounding the spine and, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. getting into the correct uh, position there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. Uh, Let's see. Um, yeah, any, boy, so <clears throat> what do I want to say next? Um, 
And then, like I said, we jumped all over the place in my notes, so I don't even really know what else I have to touch on here. Uh, anything you guys can think to throw in? Like, so, boy. Some of our favorites, maybe? Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's go with, like, some of your favorite core strength and exercises. So I think there's two ways that we could do this. We could say which one's your favorites for isolating certain aspects of the core, and that's probably a good thing to touch on because mm-hmm. um, we already mentioned that probably the best core exercises, like Ricky said, are going to be things like squats and deadlifts with perfect form where you're actually bracing. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as if we're trying to isolate, do you guys have any favorite core exercises that you would recommend people try doing mm-hmm. or that you like doing yourself? Ricky, what do you got for that? Uh, you want me to go first? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, like I said, I actually do in and outs quite a bit, mm-hmm. but I do weighted in and outs. Mm-hmm. So I hold a weight between my, my feet. Oh, and, yeah. and so I do loaded, essentially weighted in and outs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's cool. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. And well, I also- you know, I'm, you know, I'm thinking with that one, Ricky, there's another way you could overload that. You could do in and outs, which I've never done them before, but I wonder what it'd be like to do in and outs on like an incline where your head is at a higher level than your, than your mm. oh, But if you yeah. have like an incline bench, you're also mm-hmm. turning into a little bit more of like you're working against gravity as you pull your your knees up towards your face. I like mm-hmm. that. And now the other thing that I do, I do weighted uh, incline sit-ups is another one that I really enjoy doing. Yeah, I actually love those too. So sit-ups got kind of a bad rap for good reason. I mean, people abuse that exercise, do it wrong. Um, you know, as we've said, like a lot of people think of sit-ups as like the go-to core exercise when really you know, squats, deadlifts, like doing things with good form is the best way to strengthen your core. Mm-hmm. But I do actually love weighted sit-ups myself because um, that spinal flexion is something you want to be able to do and you want those muscles to be strong. Mm-hmm. And the abs, the abs or any any muscles are, are the same where if you want to make them stronger, um, you want to actually overload them with resistance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you're trying to make your biceps stronger, you wouldn't grab a five pound dumbbell and do like 300 reps of bicep curls with a five pound dumbbell, you grab a 40 pound dumbbell and do, you know, six or eight reps or whatever. And the same Mm -hmm. thing with like crunches, people like to do like 20, 30, 40 crunches in a row when you could actually put a weight on your chest or I'm not sure how you weight these Ricky, but I hold them behind my head generally. Yeah. Okay. So you can use like a heavy weight and only do like five to 10 reps or whatever you're capable of. And now you're actually overloading and strengthening those muscles. Mm -hmm. You're not just doing like uh, an endurance exercise. Yeah. Cause that was, that is one big misconception that, that people think, Oh, you have to train the abs like five times a week and they got to be high reps and all this stuff. And I mean, I'm sure you can get a flatter stomach or maybe smaller abs. you won't have like really big defined abs. If you do stuff like that. Yeah. You're not going to make them stronger. <laughs> yeah. But, but I would say, um, man, there was another point I had and I lost it. That was my fault. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so my, my the on- game is strong today. <laughs> I think the only other muscle group where there's been some studies done where higher reps are better than, you know, massive loading is the calf. Oh, and, yeah, they, yeah. and that's probably the only one I've ever heard of where if you do higher reps with your calf, you can actually stimulate more muscle growth. But mm-hmm. most other, almost all muscles will still benefit from higher, higher uh, weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially if you're trying to strengthen, yeah, usually. Right. Uh, and not just condition them, you know. I mean, you know, I know like boxers and stuff who need to have their midsection very well conditioned for a 12-round fight. They're doing mm-hmm. like, you know, 500 sit-ups or whatever while someone is slapping them in the stomach. <laughs> but, you know, if we're not going for conditioning, if we're just, if we're actually trying to make our core stronger, I like the idea of trying to overload it with intense things like that and that's where something like a hanging knee raise or a toe to bar comes in no one's doing like 50 strict toe to bars mm-hmm. you know because they're that's heavy resistance that's really hard so you're doing like six eight ten reps or whatever and then you have to get off the bar yep yeah yep. okay that's beautiful what about uh josh any interesting favorite core exercises that you like um well we mentioned most of them the, the only one we haven't mentioned that i'm a huge fan of is um um the first half of the Turkish get up. Mm, yeah. So and, and that's a, that's like a weighted sit up. Like to Ricky's point, you know, you're, you've actually got a lot of weight that you're holding in your hand as you're yep. doing that crunch. And it's rotational. 
Yeah. Um, and there's also a huge hip drive using your glute on the one side. So I love those. Um, mm -hmm. I'm biased because in jujitsu, that's a huge move to get out of a lot of positions is the ability to torque that way. But like for just general core strength and oblique, and I don't even know, like all the core basically is just you're in that laying down position, the beginning half of the Turkish get up and you bridge and roll to the elbow and then to the hand. And then mm -hmm. I'll just go back down to the elbow. But the thing that I do different than most people do, I think, is when I'm coming down, the eccentric portion from the hand to the elbow, from the elbow to the spine, I try mm -hmm. to, I call it uncoiling like a snake. And I'm sure that doesn't make any sense. But I, like you. I don't just flop down. Mm -hmm. I go from the elbow to like the tricep to the scapula, to the mid-back, and then I'm on. And Under then control, I, yep. Yeah, and that is a hell of a core exercise when you load that sucker and you hit that for reps, like, mm -hmm. you know. So I love what you just said because it, it reminded me of something I wanted to touch on with, um, like, learning how to uh, not use your hip flexors and learning how to, like, control that spinal flexion. Mm -hmm. um, I really like, uh, you know, thinking of um, – like, like trying to go vertebra by vertebra, like we used to talk about with like um, Jefferson curls, you know? Yes. Um, so like one thing I've done with clients who have a hard time even doing a crunch or whatever, because um, th they do a sit up and it's all hip flexors and they just can't find their their um, their ability to flex the spine. Mm -hmm. I like to start in the top of a sit up, which is exactly mm -hmm. what you were describing. You're doing with the Turkish get up, which is more advanced, but mm -hmm. starting in the top of like a crunch mm -hmm. um, in that nice curled spinal uh, posture, mm -hmm. and then like lowering down, doing a negative crunch, which is what you were just describing, but trying to go, you're, you're gonna set down like your first, well, your fifth lumbar vertebra, and then your fourth, and then your third, and then your second. And you're trying to put like one vertebra down to the floor at a time. Yeah. So it's a very slow negative crunch where you're lowering yourself down to the floor, one vertebra at a time. Yep. Um, and it might take you 20 seconds to go from the top of the crunch all the way down to laying down on the floor. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're basically doing an eccentric crunch mm -hmm. and learning how to like kind of control and, and become aware of where your spine is. It is very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Not right. Yeah. yeah. But I love that with the Turkish getup because that you're right. That's a great opportunity to, to strengthen your core. And most people just flop down backwards. Yeah. Yeah. Their you, back. <laughs> you hope the dumbbell doesn't smash their face in. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's probably, that's probably, I won't say it's my number one, but I, I'd say my number one would be the toes to bar, L sit, all the L sit variations, you know, on parallax, hanging. I do L sits doing rope climbs. You can do, you know, the 90 90 hold where you hold an L sit, but then you keep your elbows bent at 90 and you hold that for time. You know, that, the Turkish get up. And then for back extensions, other than a deadlift, um, would be probably just the back extension exercise on a proper GHD machine mm -hmm. um, where I'll hold weight or my fingers behind my, you know, head. I'll flex completely at the bottom of that movement and then I'll slowly uncoil like a snake <laughs> mm -hmm. um, back up to extension. I mm -hmm. sort of exaggerate the extension while squeezing my glutes and then I'll go back down. And I really like that. I've seen videos of Olympic weightlifters doing that same exact drill with a 135 pound barbell behind their neck. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's on YouTube. It's it's effing sick. Like they're front squatting 500 pounds also. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they're they're literally at the bottom of that back extension fully coiled and then they're come all the way back up with 135 at that lever point behind their neck. Wow. And then they come back down. But their extensors are just super not, thick. Super really well Yeah. Yep. Hmm. So, yeah. And that's someone who's never going to hurt their back, most likely. You know? <laughs> They're not going to have a hard time. Or they may hurt their back. <laughs> What's that? They may hurt their back because they, they lift heavy weights wow. in those competitions. That's, that's true. Yeah, they're, they're not going to hurt their back gardening or yeah. a child. <laughs> but lifting a 1,000 pounds over their head, they may. Right. <laughs> Very true. Um, I, I guess I'll say uh, one other thing I like is um, – I would encourage people to find more challenging variations of some of the typical core exercises. So like, for example, a plank, uh, you know, once you do get to the point where you can do a plank well and stuff, you know, I, I feel like I do it very well. 
I like variations on it where like I'm doing a one arm plank mm -hmm. so now I'm preventing the, the rotation in yep. my torso. Um, Josh, we came up with uh, an exercise a couple weeks ago that I thought was fantastic doing a, a one arm plank on a gymnastics ring. So yep. your, your arm is uh, supported on a gymnastics ring that's maybe like three inches above the ground. Mm -hmm. And then for the other arm, we were doing a, a dumbbell row, yep. um, you know, pulling the dumbbell up to your, your, uh, waist basically yep. and then lowering it back down by the other hand yep. um, without touching the dumbbell to the floor yep. and man, with a 15 pound dumbbell doing eight reps of that was yep. some of the most intense core work that I think I've ever done yeah um, and it's not a heavy row rowing you know doing a one-arm dumbbell row with 15 pounds is nothing for me but holding that position yep. and mm -hmm. preventing rotation and twisting yep. lit up my core like crazy it was amazing and I played with that after when we were you were fooling around with Rory and we were trying yeah. it like oh yeah that was very difficult for me yeah um, hmm. very and something else I've been playing with some very similar to that movement is in a push-up position, mm -hmm. you lift your left hand off the ground and right foot. Oh, I, yeah. The, I call those like one-arm, one-leg planks. And, and I do you, those with clients sometimes. And 20 seconds is murder. It's and you phenomenal. hold that with no rotation. Because yep. it's easy if you drop that hip, right? Mm -hmm. But if you truly are in that four points, so the feet are wide, the hands are wide, the four-point stance and you slowly lift one side and then the opposite, the other, and you lock everything down. For me, like you said, 20 seconds aside, and that is, that's cranking, so. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I don't know guys, did we uh, hit pretty much everything um, we could say about the core here? <laughs> I, uh, I think we've, we've kind of uh, tapped out on the notes that I've got here. I'm pretty sure we've hit almost everything. Um, I can't think of anything else uh, I'd like to say about this. I don't know if you guys have any additional input you want to throw in, but. No, I think I'm good. Yeah, I would just say awareness first. Yeah. Like know how to move and control your core. I think that's number one. And maybe, maybe one good last thing to say about the awareness thing is mm -hmm. uh, a really useful tool is probably taking video of yourself when you're performing things like, you know, squats, deadlifts, uh, split squats, lunges, you know, whatever, and really assessing, you know, am I keeping the correct trunk position, you know, or am I starting to get like loose and floppy there um, in, in my core, which is causing like my squat to break down or whatever. Um, you know, it, videoing yourself, sometimes you don't know like what your core is doing or what position your body is getting in. Mm -hmm. And to gain awareness of like, am I doing this right? A video comes in really handy there. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, for people training themselves, especially like record yourself doing some sets and see if you're doing it right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the sure. biggest exposure of uh, a weak core, I think, is just seeing it break down in, in the bigger movements. Yeah. And people need to strength train. <laughs> Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> if they want to get a stronger core, you know, you can buy your DVDs and this and that, you know, or fancy, you know, um, equipment. But at the end of the day, if you just strength train, um, that's going to take care of most of your core. Yep. core. As long as you pay attention to perfect form, you're always trying to do things right. Yeah, that'll take care of your core on its own. It should. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, dude. Okay, we I think we've wrapped this thing up. Um, Pretty good time today, too. <laughs> yeah, not bad. About an hour, I think. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I would just remind everyone to subscribe. The YouTube subscribers are going up uh, slowly, which is nice to see that organic growth. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I'll throw out there is if there is anyone listening that's interested in sponsoring a show, um, you know, we would love to talk to you, you know, about, you know, promoting what you're doing and if it aligns with our vision and mission, that would be cool. We'd love to hear from you. Um, coaching, we're always accepting clients for select time slots here for in-person and always online. Um, that's growing and it's always good to work with people from all over the globe. So if that's that, we'll sign off and um, we'll catch you next week. Awesome. All right. Good episode. Thanks, guys. Yep. All right. Thank Bye, you. guys.